Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back. Um, in today's class, we're going to be looking at a new area in international relations. Uh, in the previous seven lectures, we have looked at um, the scope of international relations. We've looked at its history. Uh, we have also looked at five uh, theories, five ways of looking at IRs, and those are realism, uh, liberalism, uh, feminism, uh, Marxism, and critical theory. Uh, now, having looked at these theories, we are moving on to another area of international uh, relations, which is uh, looking at its constituent actors. So, in the subsequent lectures, I am going to be looking at uh, three uh, actors, uh, the two kinds of actors in international relations. Uh, we are going to start off by looking at uh, international organizations in today's class. Uh, in the next class, we'll be looking at the nation state, and in the third class, we'll be looking at globalization. Now, so these three areas international organizations, the nation state, and globalization uh, present to us a different perspective of politics um, as transformation, uh, new actors uh, on the international field, and the manner in which these actors are. Uh, uh, playing off each other, cooperating with, uh, with, uh, with, that, with each other and uh, the last lecture of course will look at uh, the issue of globalization. Uh, so we are going to start off by looking at a curious creature and that curious creature is what we call an international organization. Uh, now the idea of an international organization uh, first appears uh, in the late 19th century. So before we start off with uh, the history of international organizations, an international organization by nature uh, links issues, uh, concerns uh, across boundaries and therefore the constitutive units of international organizations can either be individuals or member states. Now that again is a contentious issue, this creature that we speak of, uh, an international organization IOs. In short, uh, are creatures which can be uh, brought about both by individuals and that's exactly what takes place with the first uh, I.O. created in uh, Switzerland by a Swiss uh, gentleman, uh, Durant, who was uh, at the end of the Battle of Solferino, was aghast at the treatment of combatants and non-combatants. And that is, and it is here that the first I.O. emerges and that is the International Red Cross. Now the genesis of the International Red Cross tells us a little bit about what I.O.s are. I.O.s stem from a ethical, humanitarian, political, economic, uh, a wide array, uh, range of issues. But the foremost concern is to transcend uh, boundaries with a common purpose and it is here that we see that in the late 19th century uh, there are circumstances that facilitate this emergence of a global community, a global ethic, a global vision and eventually uh, one would talk about uh, globalization. So what one is essentially looking at then when we look at the International Red Cross is an organization which is committed not to political ends but has a concern for humanity in a humane way and the zeal with which the International Red Cross became a humanitarian supported organization tells us that as individuals we do have a commitment beyond our national boundaries. So the International Red Cross was one of the earliest ones and it is in the late 19th century that circumstances 
facilitate the speeding up uh, of and the possibilities and the acceleration of the growth of these international organizations. The first would be of course uh, communications. This is the age of uh, the invention of the telegraph, uh, the uh, building up of the post international postal system, uh, communications uh, in all its form whether it was uh, via sea, via air uh, was certainly speeding up and that certainly brought together a cohesive idea, a vision uh, of what international organizations could achieve. It is also at the end of the 19th century that we see uh, organizations being set up for a variety of reasons. For instance, uh, it is in 1894 that um, the International Olympics Committee is set up in Lausanne in Switzerland and that of course is with a zeal to uh, recreate the Olympics as a competitive game between gymnasts, between athletics which was held in Greece uh, thousands of years ago. It is an attempt to revive it and again it is here that we see that unlike uh, the Greek competition, the International Olympic Association is organized around nation states. Uh, similarly, one sees that uh, there are other organizations like the International um, uh, Women's Christian Association, uh, the International C uh, Christian Men's Association and these are associations which are governed around um, ethical issues, religious issues. Um, you have uh, an international association for chess, for stamp collecting, for nudism, for art. So clearly it is this, at this time that people are picking up the initiative to establish linkages across boundaries, uh, across nations and this is of course being facilitated by the technology of their times, uh, the telegraph, the postal system uh, being a few of them. Uh, by the early 20th century is when uh, the international labor organization is similarly set up. But international organizations really uh, begin to build up by the end of the First World War. And in a yearbook published uh, at the end of the First World War, uh, collects data about the number of international organizations. There are already uh, at least 100 international organizations of a variety of kind. But the one international organization which really grabs our attention at this time is the League of Nations established at the end of the First World War. Now we have looked at the, uh, the League of Nations uh, from a different perspective, from a liberal point of view and we will be looking at it from as an international organization uh, uh, right now. The League of Nations was set up by the victor states at the end of the First World War. And as we know that this is a period of uh, where the victor states were also colonizing states. So each of the uh, victor states of the First World War also had their colonies. Uh, we are referring to of course France and uh, Great Britain. And it is here that Woodrow Wilson wants to put in the rights of the colonized uh, as a mandate of um, under the League of Nations and there is a bit of a, a conflict or a confrontation between uh, Great Britain and the USA about this contentious matter whether the colonized have a right to self-determination or extremely prickly political matter and the League of Nations uh, decides to put it, it, put it under the system of mandates which again is a colonial way of addressing uh, uh, colonized people and denying them their rights and their, uh, their uh, right to self-determination. The League of Nations is the earliest organization which is committed to peace and security. So as an organization, it is uh, built, designed with the intention to prevent the occurrence of a second world war. And it does that by putting into place a concept called collective security, uh, open diplomacy. Uh, President Woodrow Wilson was championing open diplomacy as a way to 
uh, prevent secret diplomatic alliances which had emerged, which had caused the First World War. So in many ways one can see that there is a non-state actor emerging from the intentions of uh, states. It is being given a certain gravitas, a certain responsibility, a certain uh, vision which possibly uh, state actors do not have. And it is also being seen as something which can address global peace. And there is an admission here that perhaps particular nation states or states cannot achieve what an international organization can and therefore by the early 20th century one sees that international organizations are tumbling out uh, as creatures of hope, uh, creatures of transnationalism, uh, creatures who can embody uh, visions and ideals which individual states cannot. Uh, we do know that the uh, Second World War did, does take place and the League of Nations is unable to prevent it. It is also around this time that uh, critics and uh, writers of all kinds from uh, E.H. Carr to Leonard Wolf to David Mitrani who, who we will be meeting again in, during this lecture are consciously thinking about the possibilities which international organizations can throw up. And many of these possibilities are realized uh, even while the Second World War is taking place. The Second World War starts in 1939. The world is divided between uh, the Allied and the Axis powers. And uh, during the war itself, there begin negotiations and discussions for the reconstruction of the world, the post-World uh, War order. And all of these take place in uh, America and it is here that the seeds of gigantic uh, universal uh, international organizations are sowed. And these would be the negotiations which take place in the Burton Oaks, uh, at Yalta, at Potsdam, at Bretton Woods. And it is here that international organizations are seen as that body uh, which is above states and which can address issues of peace and security and a vast array of issues. Uh, in October 1945, the United Nations is set up as a successor to the League of Nations and it is far more institutionalized uh, compared to the League of Nations. The United Nations as envisioned has a general assembly constituting of all the member states of the United Nations. It also has a security council uh, which has the permanent five uh, members and it is these five members who are the big three. They call the big three during the second world war and this would be um, Roosevelt of America. Churchill of Great Britain and Stalin of uh, USSR and this uh, vision of the big three working together uh, didn't quite work out because their cooperation during the war um, um, evaporated uh, at when the war ended. But there was a hope that great powers would be able to cooperate in order to uh, prevent uh, uh, war and ensure peace. And it is here that we look at the preamble of the United Nations Charter. So if you do have the opportunity uh, to pick up the United Nations Charter, which is a very slim book, possibly the size of your palm and can, can fit, fit in your pocket very easily. The United Nations Charter is that uh, slender document which Held the, opt, uh, held the hope of these warring nations that we, uh, the nations of this world, can eliminate the scourge of war. Uh, the charter starts off by looking at uh, maintaining peace and security, uh, maintaining cordial relations with neighbors, uh, upholding uh, human rights and, international and standards of human life and dignity. So it is almost ironic that it is from the ashes of 
uh, the Second World War that this vision emerges of a international organization taking that up and that's the United Nations. So as I mentioned, there is the General Assembly, there is the Security Council uh, with the permanent five members. Uh, those would be uh, Great Britain, USA, China, Russia uh, and uh, France uh, and the USA, sorry. Uh, and these five states have uh, what is called the veto power, which is that during a decision, um, uh, no decision can be implemented if one of them disagrees. So it requires the consensus of all five. Uh, and uh, uh, there is also sec uh, Secretary General uh, upon whom, who represents the United Nations. Uh, and there is a wide variety of um, subsidiary bodies set up. Uh, one of them, for instance, uh, is the United Nations uh, Committee on for Refugees. Um, there is the UNESCO, which is for Educational, Scientific, uh, Cultural Organization. And it is here that uh, IOs truly uh, accelerate in numbers. They mushroom in numbers. And there is a variety of them from the gravest of matters, such as that of refugees, looking to refugees and um, and in 1946 for instance there is the international whaling uh, commission set up to look into the issue of these large marine animals so the 1940s and the 1950s are a period when uh, ios are being looked at as uh, recipes for peace, as implementers of peace, as solutions for the many problems that have been afflicted in uh, which uh, international politics is afflicted by. And uh, you also see that there is an emergence of a non-state actor which has greater control and is, in, and is vested with certain powers which uh, states do not. Now, up to this point, uh, international politics is dominated by uh, Western powers, uh, China being the only one which is represents Asia and uh, the P5 states uh, are also representative of the five continents and therefore China represented Asia. But uh, between 1945 and 1946 is when one sees a huge spate in the third wave of decolonization, when one sees uh, newly liberated states uh, staking their membership, uh, staking their claim as sovereign uh, participants in international politics. And it is here that international organizations then shifts from being a first world uh, manifestation, first world creation to being a third world uh, participation from the third world as well. So by the 1960s, uh, uh, when the membership of the General Assembly has accelerated, has increased uh, tremendously by the new members, by the newly decolonized uh, states, one also sees the emergence of third world organizations, international organizations. And by the late 1960s, uh, there is a call for the for a new international economic order. This is also a time when dependency theorists like uh, Cardoso and Rolf Prebich and Andre Gunder Frank and Emmanuel Wallerstein are arguing about third world countries uh, disassociating or uh, disconnecting from their dependency. And it is here that uh, one sees or uh, the emergence of a third world um, unity in the shape of NIEO and we know that in the 1970s uh, the Yom Kippur war takes place. There is the oil crisis, uh, the value of the dollar uh, slides considerably against uh, uh, the gold stock. So there are considerable changes and dynamics which allows the emergence of the G77, again an international organization which is reflective of the distinct needs of third world countries. So what one sees is that international organizations are reflective of international politics, the changes in international politics and it is also at this time that one sees that 
uh, civil society uh, starts contributing uh, in terms of uh, international scientific panels. So by the nine by uh, 1988, you have the international uh, panel on climate change, which has a number of uh, scientists, people who are drawn in from civil society, who are now looking at issues not as a nation state at all, but from a scientific objective point of view. Uh, so we're going to pause over here and look at how far we've come in evaluating international organizations and then we're going to look at uh, the various uh, ways in which one can categorize an international organization. So what we've seen so far is that the late 19th and 20th century is the period where uh, international organizations really bloom. Uh, it is also stems from uh, admission of states of the incapacity to govern and by the end of the 20th century one sees that there are a wide variety of international organization you have the north atlantic treaty organization you have the warsaw pact uh, in um, europe you also have the emergence of the europe a uh, coal and steel community which would then become the european union uh, you have the CENTO, um, the G77, and along with that you have financial uh, um, organizations such as the IMF and the World Bank. So we are going to pause over here and look at the categorization of Joseph uh, and Nye, uh, sorry, Kiyohen and Nye, uh, Robert Kiyohen and Joseph Nye's categorization of these international organizations. And they argue that these organizations uh, foster interdependence, uh, they foster a certain transnationalism and uh, that transnationalism could be of a variety of kinds whether it is financial markets or uh, the flow of trade and objects but there is a certain coming together of the world through these international organizations and uh, this is accompanied by several texts or uh, several writers who are mulling upon the possibilities of uh, supranationalism or supra-regionalism by which we mean something which is greater uh, than uh, states and moving beyond its boundaries. So having said that, let's just stop and look at the membership of international organizations, whether one can make a categorization on the basis of the membership of those states. Uh, so here we uh, refer to the classic text on international organizations by Clive Archer. Uh, the book is incisive and covers uh, possibly every aspect of international organizations and Archer argues that international organizations can be divided on the basis of membership between state and non-state actors by which he means that several organizations are constituted by sovereign states. But there are also organizations such as the World Meteorolo Meteorological Organization which looks at civil society and non-state actors as members. Which means that international organizations have a legal personality. We have looked at international law and within international law states are given a certain legal personality and a few international organizations need not even have a member uh, constituent states as uh, their members and of course the reference here are, is here to MNCs, multinational corporations which in many ways are international organizations in terms of their reach, uh, their scope, uh, their scale of operation and how deep their tentacles travel across the world. So MNCs certainly are a kind of an international organization but uh, they aren't international organizations in the truest sense but they also reflect, uh, uh, reflect as to how uh, international actors are of a wide variety and of all kinds of um, configurations 
uh, and uh, combinations and MNCs are just one of them. So whether it is Nike, whether it is uh, McDonald's, whether it is Pepsi, whether it is a uh, Gap uh, or oil companies, uh, these uh, Exxon is uh, what comes to mind. Uh, these companies certainly have a global reach and they certainly fall into what uh, Kyohin and I uh, define as uh, the growing transnationalism and something which accelerates that uh, interdependence between uh, and economic linkages along with that. Uh, so we have looked at international organizations of three kinds, one which are constituted by member states such as United Nations, the clearest example, um, SARC, the, uh, the organization which links South Asian uh, states together uh, would be classic examples. And then you also have uh, issue based organizations like OPEC uh, and then you have organizations like M MNCs which are not classic international organizations but they do have a role to play. They have a considerable political um, um, influence on international politics. Uh, and uh, those are the two ways in categorizing uh, international organizations as the constituent members, who are the members, whether they are states and or whether they are not states. So that's the first uh, categorization on the basis of membership. The second form of categorizing international organizations is by looking at its scope. And over here, Archer distinguishes between universal and regional. So again, uh, organizations like the IMF, which, or, which enjoys a membership of almost every sovereign state, about 190 and above, uh, the World Trade Organization formed in 1995, um, again, more than 190 states, the United Nations, the General Assembly, uh, are all examples of a universal uh, membership, the United Nations uh, body on human rights, on women's rights are bodies which have a universal scope. And on the other end, you have regional organizations, a uh, classic example being NATO, um, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, uh, the NAFTA, the North Atlantic Free Trade uh, Agreement, uh, the European Union, again, which is uh, completely regional in scope, uh, hope and uh, uh, and its scope is completely regional. So one can see that there are a large variety of uh, international organizations. And in the next section, I'll be looking at how uh, the manner in which uh, international organizations play out and how theorists uh, theorize uh, international uh, these international organizations. But before we get to that stage, just a small uh, example of the power and authority that IOs uh, wield on us. We often imagine uh, the international as something away from us at a distant future, at a distance, at a distance for, for sure. Uh, in 1999, uh, in Seattle, uh, a ministerial uh, meeting was to be organized of the World Trade Organization and it is at at this point in Seattle in this year that uh, which witnesses a huge number of protesters, young uh, uh, university students, uh, people championing the environment, people uh, protesting against the imposition of the World Trade Organization. And if there is one organization which uh, invites um, debate and dissent to uh, very passionate degree, it would be the World Trade Organization. Now, uh, the protests in 1999 were against the increasing invasive authority allowed by the WTO, which meant that the World Trade Organization would have authority on matters which nation states previously had. So, when we're looking at the evolution of international organizations, there is also a conflict, a tension 
a palpable tension between nation states and uh, states and international organizations and there is a accompanying debate about the corrosion of the sovereignty of these um, states over their own boundaries and the growing invasive authority of international organizations. So the World Trade Organization as an organization has been the site of uh, protest, uh, rejection, of uh, questioning its mandate and the World Trade Organization show, highlights the conflict of sovereignty, who has an authority over people, is it the state or is it the World Trade Organization and um, for those who are interested the 1999 uh, demonstrations against the WTO also were upheld as a fight against globalization. So we see that there are two interlaced uh, ideas over here, the, one, the first is that international organizations have a mandate which is global in nature and that authority is something which is handed over by states and yet at the same time there is a refusal, there is a push against that authority handed over to international organizations and uh, the World Trade Organization, the protest against that is just one of the many examples of uh, resisting that uh, invasion and resisting that authority uh, which also corrodes the authority of uh, the nation state. Uh, so before we look into the role and functions of international organizations, uh, it might be useful to stop and look at um, the um, qualifications of being an uh, international organization um, and the reason why I say that is because um, in the 21st century there is a wide uh, range of actors who are not who have private interests uh, who nonetheless have a global reach and of course the example that comes to one's mind is the almost insane uh, influence of uh, Facebook as a uh, as a global uh, network connecting people across boundaries but also one which has uh, a considerable influence in uh, how and what people uh, see uh, the opinions they read and the opinions that they make so what one can say is that in international uh, in IR there are a vast number of uh, a range of non-state actors uh, international organizations are one of them and uh, MNCs uh, other bodies with have private interests uh, are of another and therefore it, it does help to pause and look at uh, the criteria of an international organization and the person who we turn to is uh, the writer Anthony Judge and Anthony Judge lists out a few criteria which allows us then to uh, evaluate uh, whether an organization is an IO or not. So the first thing he uh, points out is that the scope and intention must be global and must have at least more than three states uh, and uh, over here when we talk about a global reach it um, of course allows uh, MNCs to be considered but not with the second criteria. Uh, these member states must have voting rights which allows uh, policies and decisions to be uh, made on a democratic basis. Uh, voting rights must be equally shared between member states. Uh, no one member state should be allowed a greater voting right or a greater occupation of a seat uh, for more than a stipulated period of time. Uh, most importantly perhaps a judge points out as to how international organizations must cooperate and comply uh, with other uh, bodies be it states or non-state actors which means that the basic idea is to cooperate, uh, integrate, uh, rely on one another and achieve a common purpose. The last criteria the judge lists out is that there must be a headquarters, a permanent headquarters and we do know that uh, most international organizations have 
uh, one the WTO has one in Switzerland, uh, uh, the United Nations is in New York and international organizations must have a, a, a headquarters, a building, a bureaucratic structure where they employ, recruit individuals who are working for uh, with the vast amounts of paperwork and um, uh, sessions and uh, objectives to be realized. Now with this we also see the emergence of an international uh, uh, set of workers, people who work for international organizations uh, uh, also have certain benefits which others do not and are part of an international bureaucracy as against the national bureaucracy, uh, people appointed in the World Bank, the IMF, the World Trade Organization are just a few, but there's a vast array of uh, international organizations which are committed to uh, environmental, uh, to uh, the preservation of the environment, whether it is uh, Greenpeace, Oxfam, these are non-governmental organizations, international ingos, uh, but cooperation with them uh, allows them to see them work with a certain solidarity. So judges criteria tells us that uh, international organizations work alongside other actors, uh, be it uh, states, uh, be it international non-government organizations such as Greenpeace and Oxfam, Amnesty International, uh, Doctors Beyond Boundaries, uh, the Red Cross would be classic examples of uh, organizations which do not have member states but nonetheless uh, have a global reach uh, and a global uh, uh, outlook uh, and aim to integrate the world and treat it as one. Uh, having done that, we are now going to look at the roles and functions of international organizations and we return here to Clive Archer and Clive Archer lists out three uh, roles played by uh, uh, IOs and the first one is that of an instrument. Uh, now Gunnar Mirdal uh, tells us that international organizations are something above uh, states themselves. They have a personality which comes from the combined uh, responsibility vested in them and they have a certain power over us, over states and at the same time that can be wielded uh, against states themselves. Now classic example of that is uh, that of an instrument. Can a IO be treated as an instrument to achieve a particular state's ends and uh, we see that the United Nations was uh, the instrument in America's hands in the early decades from 1945 to 1960 when the General Assembly had still not been populated by uh, newly decolonized states. And it is here that we see that the United, Nation, uh, the United States uses the United Nations uh, leading one to say that the United Nations is the United States. It does a remarkable, it does a number of things in pushing off uh, the USSR, whether it is the creation of Israel, uh, whether it is uh, uh, preventing USSR from interfering in North Iran, whether it is uh, the North Korean uh, issue, whether it is the appointment of the extension of the term of Trigiv Lee, who was the Secretary General, one sees that the uh, United States uses the United Nations as a means to its own uh, end. Of course, uh, the USSR does veto certain efforts, but we also see that organizations can be manipulated, uh, can be used to achieve a nation's interest and uh, this period of the United Nations is a classic example of uh, the USA using it to its own uh, personal uh, private gains and interests during uh, the Cold War. So the first uh, way in which uh, organization can be used is by using it as a tool, by a state using it as a tool and as a means 
to a particular end. Uh, the second is that of arena and over here we see that uh, the general assembly is a spectacular ground it's like a world parliament where states come together uh, make uh, speeches uh, put forward political agendas and also um, invite global attention on that particular space so the general assembly is a democratic a uh, space for uh, states, member states to uh, look at, um, to draw attention to particular issues and over here we see that UNCTAD, the United Nations uh, Conference on Trade and Development, which was a key uh, area, which was a fundamental political issue of uh, developing states was used uh, very uh, ably in, uh, by uh, developing countries, whether it is the NIEO and uh, similarly in the conference on environment in uh, Stockholm in 1972, uh, Indira Gandhi made the famous uh, uh, speech connecting poverty to pollution. So uh, international organizations also function as a platform. Uh, as uh, as an arena, as a way in which uh, individual states can make uh, political uh, declarations, uh, spirited speeches and uh, there are multiple sites of looking at uh, these um, arenas as uh, platforms for states to enact their uh, um, to make their speeches and to make political positions. Uh, the third, uh, so we've looked at actor uh, arena and the third way in which IOs are as, as instruments and over here we see that certain organizations have powers against sovereign states themselves which means that once these organizations have taken shape they exercise a power above sovereign states which means that sovereign states no longer have uh, can no longer manipulate control uh, influence these international organizations and of course the uh, the one organization which comes to mind is the international uh, criminal tribunal and this is the tribunal which sits at the hague in the netherlands and this organization is remarkable for divesting itself, for detaching itself from nation states. So even though uh, states appoint uh, lawyers uh, are appointed within this tribunal, uh, decisions, debates, uh, consequences of the International Criminal Tribunal are something which cannot be uh, questioned, which cannot, which are above the sovereign state themselves. So the International Criminal Tribunal itself has had a uh, interesting history. Uh, states like the United States have been uh, unsure about whether uh, such a, a supra sovereign, uh, such a supra sovereignty, should be allowed to uh, to a tribunal. And of course, it has had uh, the history of the International Criminal Tribunal has been rich in. Uh, picking up cases, uh, prosecuting criminals, uh, highlighting issues of international justice. States can petition uh, them and the second organization which, uh, which similarly has uh, authority over states is the uh, dispute settlement body, the DSB of the WTO. Now like the International Criminal Tribunal, the uh, the dispute settlement body of the World Trade Organization similarly functions as a body which has authority over sovereign states and again uh, that, build, that brings us to the classic conflict between international organizations and uh, states uh, who has a greater role over the other, uh, who is uh, corroding the force of the other and eventually we are looking at a structure of global governance where global governance is imagined to be the side-by-side -side cooperation of 
states, international organizations, uh, international non-governmental organizations uh, allying themselves together for cooperating with each other, relying on each other for an uh, integrated uh, world, which is what a global community is about. So what we've seen so far is that international organizations have a variety of functions. Uh, these would be, which we just listed out, would be uh, actor, arena and instrument. Uh, the last bit about the instrument is perhaps the most uh, divisive and debatable about the right of certain tribunals, certain bodies over sovereign states itself and even within the World Trade Organization there have been uh, verdicts where powerful states such as uh, the USA has lost a case which tells us about the neutrality of these proceedings and also perhaps the ability of these organizations to be really supra-national uh, and above uh, the nation and its boundaries. Right, so what we've done so far is we've looked at a wide variety of international organizations. We've seen its multipli multiplicity. So as of now, there are about, uh, there are general um, speculations and uh, 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 the data suggests that there are more than 2,000 organizations and uh, this is a, a time when uh, the compression of time and space and telecommunications has aided the growth of international organizations. Uh, but having said that, uh, um, several forms of them exist. And uh, in the last section of today's lecture, we're going to be looking at as to how theorists have looked at uh, IOs and how have they engaged with uh, IOs as a new category of uh, actors on the international web. So let's start off with uh, realism. Uh, realism, as we know, uh, places a huge uh, places a huge mandate on the role of the state, uh, whether it is uh, Waltz, whether it is Morgenthau or E.H. Carr. The state is the primary constituent um, actor of international politics. So realists uh, are skeptical about the sovereign authority of international organizations and they're inclined to believe that international uh, IOs are arenas and actors but are seldom, can seldom be greater than um, states themselves. And realists tell us that eventually power flows from the state, the state's authority uh, over the monopoly of violence is uh, is one area which uh, IOs can never compete, uh, the right to use violence. And uh, IOs exist as a subsidiary force, as an alliance, uh, but the key figures are primarily uh, states and uh, states are not going to grant that um, I'm not going to cede that authority which they have based on their wealth, based on their material capabilities, based on their military capabilities is something which uh, does not take away from the sovereign right of the state. So whether it is the right to wage wars, the ability to uh, use violence, uh, realists uh, are unshakable in their faith that uh, IOs exist as a corollary but not as the primary constituent of international politics. Uh, we now come to uh, liberals, liberal institutionalists and liberal institutionalists celebrate uh, international organizations because international organizations as uh, uh, Robert Keohane and Joseph Nye tell us foster interdependence in multiple ways in travel, in finance, in the global flow of people and objects. And let us remind ourselves that liberal institutionalists place a huge premium on the magical powers of trade. 
so for uh, liberal institutionalist uh, ios are that panacea are that uh, body are that organization which aid in melting uh, tariff barriers and in aiding uh, the flow of trade within uh, structural realism uh, within um, liberal institutionalism a major um, uh, contribution has been made by the scholar uh, david mitrani whose views are categorized as functionalism now mitrani's views uh, mitrani david mitrani is a philosopher a thinker who is writing not a philosopher thinker and writer primarily is writing before the second world war and also uh, after the second world war and his vision is uh, called functionalism because he imagines a global uh, organizations on the basis of uh, the functions that we need to provide so whether it is the international organization of uh, health of uh, sanitary issues of um, the environment uh, mitrani believes that organizing the world around uh, issues rather than states is a way of moving forward and of organizing the world um, not along uh, nation states but along issues so functionalism uh, looks at facilitating uh, looks at bettering world conditions on the basis of issues so security issues peace issues humanitarian issues refugee issues would be much better managed if we allowed ourselves to or have a borderless understanding to this and the clearest example of mitrani's uh, views and opinions are of course the european union the european union started off as a organization of coal and steel where it was imagined that the quick and easy shift from one part to another would only aid uh, integration so mitrani's views are certainly uh, influential and one can see that it does have a tangible impact on uh, global politics uh, functionalism is a point of view which uh, allows um, the emergence of organizations on the basis of issues is what he's arguing so liberalism uh, realism and functionalism and we come to the fourth one and that is uh, marxism now interestingly uh, marxism uh, we've looked at the theory of marxism in the previous uh, lecture but marxism as a a a perspective of international organizations in the 1960s or uh, whether and the 1970s when we look at uh, uh nyayare julius nyayare and other uh theorists who were critical of global integration uh one sees that there was a certain distancing from international organizations itself so whether it is the non alignment movement uh whether it is other uh, exponents of detachment of distancing for its whether it is rolf prebish whether it is cardoso one sees that there is there was an active resistance to uh, international organizations and this is reflected most clearly in the resistance to globalization itself so when we look at the marxist understanding of um, international organization it is linked to a resistance to the global capitalizing transformations and over here we have a uh, marxist scholars such as justin drosenberg uh, david harvey uh, amongst others who critique the form of uh, globalization which is being facilitated which only uh, broadens the gap between uh, the rich and the poor now a small example of that are a uh, movie such as uh, erin brockovich which highlight the plight of individuals against this vast corporation which is uh, 
profiteering and plundering with reckless uh, indifference to the face to the cost to the cost of humanity so marxist and left leaning positions on international organizations uh, are slightly hesitant about uh, the consequences of these organizations uh, playing a role in our lives and of course the classic uh, examples over here are the Bretton Woods institutions, the IMF, uh, the World Trade Organization and the World Bank and there has been a classic resistance to these organizations on the basis of the uh, neoliberal uh, policies that they encourage, the neoliberal uh, policies that they spout and the manner in which they uh, uh, loop in states under what is called the structural adjustment program. So international organizations are far from neutral and we do know that uh, the Bretton Woods institutions are a highly contested uh, uh, financial institutions with a great degree of uh, control over our lives. Um, structural adjustment programs are those programs which uh, uh, bring in developing countries into the mesh of neoliberalism and as a consequence underdevelop these economies. So the left uh, and the Marxist understanding of international organizations is fairly distinct from uh, Mitrani's functionalism, uh, from the neoliberal celebration of international organizations and therefore we come to, to the end of today's lecture by looking at uh, IOs as part of the globalizing world. Uh, IOs have aided uh, the emergence of a global community, have aided the facilitation of a global community, have aided globalization and therefore we end today's lecture with questions of uh, what is globalization, uh, what is the nature of globalization and uh, who is globalizing and at whose cost and at whose cost rather and these are the issues that we will be taking up in the subsequent two lectures where we will be looking at the state and the niche and globalization. So just to sum it up, uh, IOs are creatures of the 20th century, uh, they are created by states but often have a power over states and they are certainly creatures which are here to stay. Uh, because they do things which states are incapable uh, or are reluctant to do. A uh, classic example being that of peacekeeping. So those of you who are interested could look up um, the politics of um, United Nations peacekeepers, uh, especially during the Cold War and the politics uh, around that. And all of these are extremely rich, interesting areas, whether it's the International Crime Tribunal or uh, peacekeeping or the Amnesty International. Uh, so with that I stop here and in the subsequent lecture I will be looking at uh, the modern state and issues of globalization. Thank you.